G'day guys, this is a podcast episode that you do not want to miss. So today I have on Dr. Stephen Hussey, who is, he's, he's an author, he's written a couple of different books, and he is one of the like leading people that I know of who talk about, you know, heart disease, health, and having a proactive approach to absolutely crushing and living life at your best. And this podcast was is ridiculous. There are so many practical tools here and tips and advice in terms of improving your heart health, improving your metabolic function, and in terms of like literally optimizing your life and some tools of and and some education and awareness of what you can actually do within your house, within your life, with the, the food that you eat and everything that you can do to make sure that you are healthy as and that you're living a life of being extremely healthy. So please listen to this podcast the whole way through. Guys, if you are, if you do get any value from these podcasts and you find them beneficial or helpful, please, it would mean the absolute world to me if you could just really quickly share this podcast onto your story. If you just quickly click the link, click the little square box with the arrow and put it onto your story like subscribe and then also if you really like value this stuff it means a lot because what what essentially my goal is like we just recently this podcast has got like number 180 in the australian health and fitness podcast category and we want to get this podcast up to number one and the only way that that's going to happen is if we work together and if you guys jump onto if you listen on apple and you leave a review and put a review on there that helps us increase this stuff, increase the podcast so that we have more people listening and that they're getting this good information. They're getting like more self-aware and they're taking another step closer to living the best version of themselves and their lives as best as possible. And you guys are directly contributing to that. If you're sharing, liking, subscribing and, and leaving reviews, that would mean the absolute world to me, the world to the podcast, it would mean the world to the podcast guests and for all the people who are listening. Also, at the moment, I have some coaching available, as you might have heard from the start. I have part-time, full-time, and some community coaching, which I'm starting up. If you're interested, just go to coreyboutwell.com and follow the prompts in there, and we can have a chat, and we can talk about some of the things that we have on offer. Also, in terms of everything that we've learned, like in this actual podcast, what we go uh, through and go ahead with is that I have a recipe, recipe ebook, which essentially on my articles on my website, I I spend a lot of time researching the best ingredients, the most healthy ingredients to use. And then I put them into an ebook so that they're extremely tasty. And it's got all the sequences to how to actually cook and make them tasty and that they're extremely healthy for you, especially in terms of like there's hacks in there for meal prep. There's bone broth potions. I've got like all of these different, like I got fancy meals, I've got easy meals and just a lot of like real simple stuff, which is super tasty and super healthy. And like, you don't want to miss out on that recipe ebook. Like it's an absolute godsend. I highly recommend. And that'll be linked below as well. Same with all the Dr. Steven stuff. All of his things will be linked below. And obviously guys, this podcast is sponsored by Eternum Labs. And we get into some of the Eternum Lab stuff in here. It's just a little secret. If you're listening to this is one of the main things that we talked about in this podcast was for the importance of health and oxidative stress and making sure that your body has enough um, antioxidants to like support itself is glutathione and we have a glutathione product incoming so stay tuned for that we also have a whole bunch of awesome products on the eternal labs website and you can go to eternallabs.com.au we have products well basically the main mission for eternal labs right is to help people like you especially the entrepreneurial type people or people who want to be the best versions of themselves is to support you guys as best as possible with the best products so that you can get so that you can have the best energy and be extremely productive and be extremely proactive by using our supplements and obviously glutathione is going to be one of those but we have a, a whole range of lion's mane we've got two products Zen and Zone, we sell Resveratrol and all the other good stuff on there. So you can go onto there and get those. And obviously you can use the code Corey to get yourself a 10% off discount, which is awesome. So again, guys, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Thank you for choosing to be the best version of yourself and for choosing to learn all of this really good stuff so you can apply it to yourself and live a really good, happy, healthy, and long life. It's just 
it's just so good and so fantastic. And I couldn't recommend this podcast anymore. So again, if you like it, please share it and please leave a review. And without any further ado, guys, I hope you enjoy this podcast with Dr. Stephen Hussey, as I thought it was absolutely amazing and mind blowing. I'm literally going to send it to my parents after this because I'm like, you guys need to hear this. This is absolutely ridiculous. So yes, without any further ado, guys, please enjoy, please enjoy this podcast and I'll see you in the next one. G'day, Stephen. Thank you so much for jumping onto the show. Yeah, no problem, man. Excited to be here. Yeah. So what have you been working on recently? And, and just, just real quickly, what are some new things that you have learned recently that you have found has just been amazing? Hmm. Um, well, I, one, what I've been working on is, is uh, as we were talking a little bit before the podcast, is uh, you know, I, I wrote this book about the heart and um, I originally self-published it. And then publishers got word of it. And so I got picked up by a publisher. So now it's, it's not available, but we're re- working to republish it through the publisher. So we're having to go through all like the, you know, the editing and, and, and marketing and that kind of, those kind of steps. So um, I've been working on editing my book, um, uh, which is, uh, I admit, sometimes frustrating because I've already written it. And now I got to go back and, and, and work on it again. But uh, that's, that's what I've been working on recently. And then uh, I guess one thing, that I, uh, I guess, sort of knew, but it was kind of confirmed by a study just that just recently came out, um, was that, um, so I've always, you know, been of the opinion that, that low cholesterol is not the best for us or having really low cholesterol is not the best for us. Oh, um, but yeah. a study just came out a few, maybe almost a month ago now, um, that showed that um, the optimal levels of cholesterol, when you look at all cause mortality, Um, like for total cholesterol. And I don't know what these numbers will be in whatever metrics they use in, in Australia, but, um, but for the States, the, 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 um, uh, the total cholesterol between 200 and 250 and LDL cholesterol between 100 and 150 um, is where people had the lowest all cause mortality. If people had levels at those, at those numbers, and those are actually would be seen as higher than is, is what is desired by Western medicine. Um, So Um, the cholesterol is not the enemy and, and it does a lot of good things in the body. And this study shows that when we have quote unquote, elevated cholesterol, slightly elevated cholesterol, it's actually best for, you know, um, you know, preventing death from all causes. Well, I'm going to go to my blood tests and just give them an absolute smack right now (laughs) because I'd say that they were a little bit elevated. I think we have the same, um, uh, metrics, but what I was looking at mainly is like the, um, for me personally, just when I was looking at it, just because I'm a little bit skeptical around the averages um, for cholesterol, I was just looking at the ratio and I was like, well, if, if my ratio is all right, then I should be, should be fine. Is, is that true? Or you mean like the, it? like the trig to HDL ratio? Yep. Of the HDL yeah. to LDL. Yeah. Well, HDL to LDL. Yeah. The ratio that, that one's there is important, but I'd say even more important than that is the triglyceride to HDL ratio. Okay. Um, because that one is one of the best, I guess, um, markers for what we call metabolic health, yeah. um, being metabolically flexible, um, uh, being insulin sensitive. All, those are all kind of the same Ooh. thing. Um, and, uh, so, so that number, you know, if you divide tri- triglycerides by HDL, uh, you want it to be like 1.5 or lower. And, and it, that's, that's in the metrics that I use in the States. Um, so, so people would have to convert it if they have different metrics. Um, but that's, that's one of the, I guess if that number is good, that's one of the best predictors of not getting chronic disease in the future, whether it be cancer, heart disease, diabetes, whatever. So looking at your triglyceride to HDL is probably a lot more important ratio than the HDL to LDL. And if your cholesterol is a little bit above what the standard is that's a good thing yeah definitely a good thing oh crazy <laughs> yeah right yeah because so many people just like look at your cholesterol all the time you're like oh i gotta lower it i gotta lower it but that's just fantastic yeah yeah and i mean there's a whole you know big story if you want to get into it of why cholesterol is is thought to be this bad thing um, but it turns out it was some, some bad research. So we can get into that if you want to. Yeah. I'd love uh, to know why I'd honestly, I a hundred percent love to know why, because there's, there's so much going on with cholesterol and there's like a lot of people that I know that are on like <laughs> medicine for cholesterol. Um, mm. and obviously if you're looking at cholesterol and then blood pressure and 
trying to figure out the two between the both. It can also get confusing. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to know all about the. Um, yeah. So, so the whole idea started. Um, it, well, first of all, like, you know, the turn of the, the uh, 1900s, I guess, um, cardiology was, wasn't even really a profession. There was, there was very few cardiologists. It just wasn't needed, you know, but then like in the 1950s after world war II, um, you know, heart disease, especially in America started to, to grow in prevalence and people were wanted an answer to, to why, uh, that was. And so this one guy named Ansel Keys, who's a scientist at the university of Minnesota, um, he gave people an answer. So he basically looked at the data from a bunch of different countries, um, and the data from like how much heart disease they have to how much like saturated fat they eat and different types of foods they eat. And he found that there was a correlation between how much heart disease the country had and how much saturated fat they ate. Um, and, but what we found out later was that there was, there was data from 22 countries available at the time. And he used the six. And then later he did another study. He used the seven countries that gave him the correlation that he wanted to see. Um, and so the, so the, I guess the foundation that the, that saturated fat in the diet and, and higher levels of cholesterol, um, cause heart disease came from that. And then later, um, maybe like eight years later, there was two other scientists um, who redid that study with the, all the data from the 22 countries that was available and found there was no correlation whatsoever. Um, and what? then, yeah. And then interestingly, but you know, by that time the ship had sailed and the message was saturated fats, bad for you. Don't <laughs> yeah. eat it, you know? And so that's just been, that's stuck ever since. Now, the really curious thing is that there was a bunch of studies done. There was the Minnesota coronary survey. There was the, um, uh, the diet, um, the Sydney diet heart study. There was a Helsinki businessman study. There was a study in Norway that all tested pretty much the same thing. They all took people and, um, they substituted saturated fat in their diet with unsaturated fat. And then they compared that to a control group, group control group where they didn't change the diet. And, um, so they use like margarine or vegetable oils to substitute the saturated fat in, in the diet. And every single one, every single one of those studies showed that when they substituted the, um, the, um, vegetable oils or the margarine, the unsaturated fat in the diet, that there was a higher risk of heart disease. More people died of heart disease, had heart attacks, things like that. Um, and the interesting thing was that in the Minnesota coronary study, Ansel Keys, the guy who did that previous research, he was one of the lead authors on the study. Um, but the study didn't turn out like they wanted it to. So his name was, was not on the study anymore. Like he was the lead author, the lead investigator, but he, uh, he, he took his name off the study <laughs> and that study was finished in like uh, the late, uh, maybe 1973, I think it was. And this is when they finished that study and it wasn't published until like 15 or 16 years later. What? Um, and, and when they, when they did publish it, it was, it was published in like a small journal that no one really reads rather than like the new England journal of medicine or something like that. So, um, and then this one guy went back and he, and he asked one of the authors, like, why didn't you publish it? Why did, wh what happened? And they're like, we didn't like the result we got. <laughs> so, so, you know, this Who whole idea, trust, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. This whole idea that saturated fat and, and animal foods and, and cholesterol and food and that kind of stuff is bad for us. Um, was a founded on bad science and then perpetuated, um, you know, because largely because there was a lot of industry backing and the idea like, you know, grain, uh, cereal companies, um, industry like that, you know, wanted this idea. They wanted to blame fat so that people would buy grains and sugars and things like that. So they put a lot of money into that. And then also, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, they see that, you know, cholesterol is high and we have a drug that can lower cholesterol. Yeah. We want this idea to be the mainstream idea so that people think they need to take medication. So they get more medications and we can make more money, you know, like, and, and people kind of think that maybe that's just, you know, conspiracy or whatever, but it's just, all it is, is just capitalism, you know, people following the money and, and that's just the result of what happened, you know? Yeah. Um, but the real important thing is to find the truth and, and to dig that up and then, and then act accordingly. Yeah. I always think that like, Oh, I sort of have this um, thought, or I think about like how this stuff got out, right? And you're like, oh my goodness, there's all this misinformation. It's misleading. We've been eating like this. We've been told to have this. This has been put here. And I always just kind of think like when it kind of comes down to it, at the time when the people made these decisions or published certain things, they were just like, we're doing what we think is best <laughs> yeah. at that time, which kind of sucks when it's been deeply ingrained into us and conditioned 
for a long period of time and now it's like, oh, coconut oil and grass-fed butter is really good for you and your cholesterol should be a little bit higher. <laughs> like that's yeah, just, that's right. I yeah. can imagine yeah. so many people's belief systems just being like, <sighs> Yeah. And, but you know, the bad thing, I guess the, cause yeah, I do, I believe you too. Like, I think that at the time people thought that that was what was best. They were doing yeah. what was best. They were finding the answers, you know? Um, unfortunately what happens after that is when we feel like when, when people find out they were wrong, they don't necessarily admit it. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's too much, there's too much to be lost, you yeah. know, as far as a Big company goes. Right. And so, so like credibility is lost, money's lost. There could be lawsuits. And so people don't necessarily, and companies don't necessarily readily admit those mistakes. Crazy. And like, why would they, to be honest? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What else have you been learning? What else is something new that you've just been like, whoa, that's fantastic. Um, new, I don't know. Um, I recently, um, read a book about how, how terrible the herbicide glyphosate is for us. Which is what um, they spray on all plants and vegetables that are, get put into our yeah. supermarkets. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, and it's a, you know, it, it comes from a, a company that has a history of making DDT and Agent Orange. So you'd think that there'd be more stringent, you know, examination procedures before that's allowed to be you know, the next product they come up with is allowed to be sprayed on things, but it's actually patented as a weed killer, as a antibiotic and, and something else. I can't remember. It's patented as three things, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty pervasive in our environment these days because what, what it's, it's an herbicide. So it's sprayed on plants and crops because um, the, the crops are genetically modified to be resistant to this herbicide. And so then you can spray the herbicide all over the place and the plants don't die, but the weeds do. Um, so, and then even if, even if there's um, plants that aren't genetically modified, like, like wheat is, is largely not genetically modified, they still spray it on there at the end because it, it brings the, the plant to seed quicker, um, the ripens up quicker. So they get a higher yield. So even if there's like, even if you buy like um, non-GMO certified kind of things, they could still be contaminated with glyphosate um, because they like to spray it on things to, to increase the yield at the end of the, the, the year. And what does glyphosate do like in your body? Do you know? Yeah. Well, like in a plant, it kills the plant by interfering with, uh, I believe it's the shikimate pathway, which basically disrupts the plant and then kills it. Um, but in, in our body, um, you know, we don't have that pathway. We're not plants. Yep. However, glyphosate, um, is just similar enough to glycine, um, which is an amino acid that it substitutes for that in like a lot of biochemical processes in our body. Um, and so that disrupts a lot of things. Um, you know, the, the specifics I'm not as familiar with as, as the, 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 the researcher who wrote that book, but like when, when you amino acids are the building blocks of, you know, our body, you know, and if you interfere with those things, that's, it's going to cause a lot of issues. Um, and people, there's, you know, there's symptoms across the board that have been found to, to be linked with, with glyphosate. Yeah. Crazy. So buy local organic vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Organic support, you know, and organic doesn't mean that it's absolutely hundred percent free of, of chemicals, but it's mm -hmm. way less, um, you know, like things cross pollinate and, you know, um, things get sprayed and they come over, but, you know, yeah, local is definitely important. And then organic is the, is the best way to protect yourself and get the least amount of toxic exposure. Yeah, true. Which is why I also find like, because of all these things and like, we're constantly eating it. And there's a lot of people who are listening to this and, and myself guilty of as well, that you just have the occasion where you're like, yeah, but I'm not going to eat organic. Like I can't today. I've got this on and I've got this done. And it's just like so readily accessible and easy to get the food from here or do something, which is why I think like su supplements can be beautiful uh, in terms of actually using supplements to like negate these things and why they're so needed and why it's such a, such a uh, big industry. What do you think are like some of the supplements that you could use to protect yourself as best as possible and make sure that you have, you know, healthy as heart as possible? Yeah. I mean, I, sometimes I hear arguments from people that say like, you know, we should get everything from diet and, and fundamentally, I agree with that, but I also yeah, realize so. that we live in the modern world yeah. and the modern world is full of toxins and yeah. people are way more stressed out. So why not, you know, up our, up our resistance a little bit by using some supplements. And I think, 
probably the number one as far as like you know, protecting yourself from toxins and things like that is glutathione. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we need that. And so one thing you can do um, to boost your body's production of glutathione is um, using glycine, which is what we just talked about with the, yeah. the, the um, glyphosate, yeah. um, how that substitutes for glycine, but glycine um, has been shown in studies that when you, when you use that, I mean, it's one of the building blocks of glutathione. So when you, when you um, eat that, which is like connective tissue proteins, like collagen proteins and things, um, when you eat that, you, your glutathione production goes up, but then you could also just take straight glutathione yeah. um, that would really help. Yeah. For anyone so, who's listening, yeah. if you're following the Eternum Labs journey at the moment, we've just come out with a glutathione product. And it's also um, really cool because I put glycine in my bone broth and I have bone broth every morning and I have it with lion's mane, um, glycine, um, glutamine and a little bit of L-theanine. And I noticed that significant, like every single day that I have that mix of things, I significantly just like feel better for the entire day. <laughs> so. I think yeah. I mean, it, it can be a game changer for people, especially if you're, you're, uh, you're, um, like your liver is feeling a little sluggish, it's got a lot of toxins to deal with and it's not making as much glutathione, you know, give your body a little boost, give it some help. Um, but then the other thing, as far as detoxification is sweating. Um, that's huge. Uh, that's people don't realize it, but you know, just, just working up a sweat every day is going to, uh, release a lot of toxins in your sweat. So. Yeah. That's one thing that I was thinking to myself, uh, before I got a sauna, cause when I lived in Adelaide, I had a sauna to move to Queensland and I don't have a sauna anymore. So I was like, damn, but there is some close by. But I even remember like thinking like, well, what does the body do in terms of being able to sweat? And it's like, well, obviously we have all these benefits when we are sweating and that's our body's like heating procedure. And what do we do to heat? Like we move. (laughs) So when I go for like a a, a really long walk, not just a small walk, but like a, you know, getting up to close to an hour every single day, or I go on like a hike, which is a little bit harder or a slow jog and immediately start sweating. Or when I'm in the gym or I'm feeling sluggish, sometimes I literally feel like hmm, my blood sugar, I don't know what it's doing right now. I feel uh, and I feel like my body's got to detox or process something and, and I feel a little bit, mm. as soon as I'm in the gym and I get towards the end of the session where I really start sweating or I go for a big walk and I'm towards the end of the walk and I start sweating or I go for a jog and I'm at the end of a jog and I start sweating, immediately start feeling better. Like as if something's just been taken off from me. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So like usually our liver has to deal with all these toxins and everything. And, and no matter how hard you try, you can't avoid all the toxins in our modern world. So you're going to be exposed to them, but yeah, usually our liver has to deal with all those. But if we, if we work up a sweat every day, we're giving our liver a huge break because we're releasing those, some of those toxins through the skin. So the liver doesn't have to deal with it. Um, and so, you know, you know, people feel like, like you say, you just kind of feel bad or whatever, but like nausea, like one of the things I think of, you know, aside from gut stuff is liver. If your liver is stressed, then nausea is one of the things you're going to feel and you're just going to feel sluggish. And, and so, I mean, that's your main metabolizer right there. So if that's backed up or, or dealing with a lot of toxins, then, then it uh, can definitely make you feel bad. So if you, if you sweat them out every day, that gives your liver a huge break. Crazy. What are some other tips or tools that you think people can use in terms of just being able to support their liver, support their heart and make sure that they yeah. sort of optimize within their body? Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, we kind of touched on it a little bit with the trig ratio ratio, but just being like uh, metabolically flexible. So like as far as the heart and the liver goes, I mean, the liver is our main metabolizing organ, but uh, the heart's really interesting and unique because it, uh, it seems to more than any of the other organs have a preference for burning um, fatty acids and ketones. Uh, and it functions way better um, when it's doing that. Uh, and I think it even has mechanisms in place that um, that ensure that it gets kind of like, it, that it always has enough fatty acids to burn. Um, one of those being that, um, you know, just the way our, our, our fats are, are absorbed and packaged at first, they're, they're packaged into chylomicrons. Um, and then that goes into the lymphatic system, but it's because they're very big. So that's the only way they can really get in, but the lymphatic system pretty much drains straight into the heart. And then when it gets there, it has to go to the, to the lungs and then it comes back to the heart. But like when it comes out of the heart, the first place it goes is back to the heart tissue where it's supplying those fats. So it's like the heart gets first dibs on the fats, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And then also there's a, they, they discovered recently, I think the study was like a couple of years ago um, 
that uh, the the heart has a like a direct signaling pathway to fat cells. Um, so basically, whenever the heart feels like it doesn't have enough fatty acids to burn, it can signal the mobilization of fats from those those fat cells, um, which is which is pretty interesting. Um, and so, you know, there's there's interesting studies that show that you know when they put like even in the presence of glucose um, in the heart tissue. Um, when they put ketones or fatty acids in there, the glucose utilization goes down dramatically. Um, so clearly the heart prefers those fuel sources. You, know, you put, you make those available and it stops using glucose, starts using the other ones. Um, and I think there are reasons for that um, as far as like protecting the heart metabolically, um, because when you burn fatty acids and or ketones, um, you, you make less oxidative stress, you get more ATP molecules from that. Um, when you, when you do that, then when you're burning glucose. And so, so I think that it, if the heart is forced to burn more glucose than it wants to, which there's, there's a situation where that can happen. Um, then it, bad things that bad things can happen, like lactic acid buildup and that kind of stuff. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, I think one hack for the heart is to make sure you're supplying it with enough fatty acids in, and ketones. You don't have to be like on a, you know, full blown ketogenic diet to do that. Um, although that's one way to get ketones available. Um, but just a, a whole foods, I'd say metabolically flexible type diet, I think will be enough to do that. Dude, that's insane. So like, firstly, just to like recap on some of those, as you mentioned, like getting the heart into the position to utilize fatty acids and ketones, as you mentioned, the lymphatic system gets it going. So like to get the lymphatic system, jump on a trampoline or go for a walk. <laughs> Mm, yeah, Prefer, yeah. Preferably a longer one or like a light jog that's going to get your lymphatic system absolutely pumping, which is then going to put your heart in a really good position to start burning fatty acids, which I'm assuming has something to do with liposis, lipolysis, It'd get you into like a sort of fat burning state. Not sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, like a, like an ketogenic state, you know, like to make yeah. ketones or like yeah. to burn fatty acids. Yeah. Like, so most of the body, you know, it's going to, it burns, like if you eat carb, a lot of carbohydrates, the body's going to burn those first. It's easier to burn them. You, you kind of, you know, burn through them pretty quickly. Um, you know, so in order for most of the body to, you know, get into a, a state where it's burning primarily fatty acids and ketones, you have to restrict carbohydrates. Um, and so that's what we would call a ketogenic diet, you know, where you restrict carbohydrates to probably less than like 20 or 30 grams of carbohydrate. And, and your body is forced to upregulate, upregulate the mechanisms to burn fatty acids and then make ketones and burn them. Um, so that's the traditional ketogenic side of things. The heart seems to be a little different that even, even when glucose is present, um, it, it, it seems like, a, like I said, to have first dibs on these things to keep it burning more fatty acids and ketones. Um, but that doesn't mean that there can't be a situation where the heart is forced to burn more more glucose than it wants to. And it has to do with our stress response and our autonomic nervous system that can trigger that kind of stuff um, because the heart's very connected to our emotional state and our, and our stress response. But, um, but, but yeah, so like, you know, ketosis, I guess, and um, it is, is the state in which you, your body takes like fats um, and it, it takes a fatty acid and it makes a ketone from it. And ketones are, interesting because you know when if, if you have extra excess energy like extra um uh, glucose your body the only thing you can do with that is store it um and has to store it as as fatty acids in fat cells um or i mean it could burn it too um but if there's extra it'll 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 store it so with a ketone though like you can take those extra fats that extra energy you may have convert them to ketones and ketones are a form of fuel um that can be wasted which sounds like a bad thing but in this case, it's a good thing because you're not storing it, um, which is why when people are going ketogenic diets, they can, you know, they pee out ketones or they breathe it out, or they sweat it out or something like that. Um, and, uh, and that's beneficial in the sense that it's not going to, it's going to help you avoid like a poor metabolic state where there's excess energy storage, um, which will lead to insulin resistance and things like that. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the making of ketones and uh, the heart specifically you know, has these mechanisms that encourage the making of ketones so that it has those as fuel source. So it doesn't have to burn glucose. The body is just ever, ever complex. Just doesn't stop. 
<laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. I don't think we'll ever fully understand it. Oh, ever, think, man. It's so advanced. Yeah. What do no. you suggest then? Like, how do you, like, it's just as far as like a practical tools. If you're someone who's like, all right, cool. I understand maybe some of those points. I understand everything mm-hmm. that Stephen just said. Like, awesome. If I want to make sure that I'm optimized with that and have a metabolically, like, metabolically flexible diet, like, what are some things that I can start doing and trying? Definitely. Um, it's a good question. Um, so there's all these diets out there, you know, like I would, I would call them, I would call them some of them dogmatic, you know, some of them restrictive, you know, there's, there's vegan diets or vegetarian, there's carnivore diets. Now there's, um, there's, um, ketogenic diets and Mediterranean and all this kind of stuff. And so people can, I get, I get caught up in certain diets and, you know, if it works for you, it works for you. And that's great. If it, if it keeps you, if, you know, being strict and restricted on something keeps you, you know, eating what you want to eat, then that's great. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, there's no perfect human diet. Um, there never has been, and there probably never will be. Um, so it's not, it's important not to be dogmatic about a certain diet and to listen to your body and, and figure out what diet works best for you. In general, though, I have a few key points. And that is that humans are not meant to consume unsaturated fatty acids in the amounts that we're consuming them. And that's mainly from vegetable oils, margarines, things like that. Uh, vegetable oils, I mean like canola oil, corn oil, soy oil, sapphire oil, that kind of stuff. Um, those are those are not human foods. We should not be eating those. And you got to be careful because they're added into a lot of food. So that's, I think that's one. Um, the, the two other culprits I think are processed grains and processed sugars. Um, those are very problematic because the vegetable oils, they like break our metabolism. Um, just the way that when they're burned in our cells, they do things that end up breaking our metabolism to a way that causes insulin resistance, which is the precursor to diabetes. Um, and then the processed carbohydrates, processed sugars, processed grains, they just are fuel to the fire, you know? So they, they don't necessarily break the metabolism. They can fatigue it, but the vegetable oils break the metabolism and they just make it 10 times worse. Um, so those are the three like major culprits. So if we're talking about what foods to avoid, those are the ones we want to get rid of in our diet. Um, and so, and I would, when I say processed grains, I pretty much mean all grains because there's no grain that's not processed. You know, you have to process grains to eat them. Grains and um, vegetable oils, kick them out the door. Boom. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You're going to feel 10 times better. And then as far as like what to eat, um, the most important thing is to eat whole foods. You know, people will talk about the macronutrients and all that stuff, which is, is important. Um, and especially if you're like a athlete and you, and you're looking for performance goals, like the macronutrients are very important, but for the average person just wanting to be healthy, I think just focus on eating whole foods, um, lower in carbohydrates. So that means like your carbohydrates should only, if they're coming from whole foods, you're going to, it's going to be lower carbohydrate. You're going to be eating things like, like berries and, and maybe a sweet potato or some winter squashes, things like that, you know, um, whole food carbohydrates. Um, but yeah, so whole foods lower in carbohydrate. Um, most of your energy, I think should come from animal fats. Um, and then the last thing is prioritize protein. Um, so make sure you're getting enough protein. That's huge. If you're getting enough protein, you're going to satiate yourself, which means you're going to eat less. And, um, you know, the, the number one, um, predictor on longevity as we age is the maintenance of muscle mass and to maintain muscle mass, you've got to get enough protein. Um, and so, and, and animal protein is very important there because, um, animal and plant proteins are not created equal. We can get, you know, so like if something says there's, there's a difference between like crude protein and then true utilizable protein. Um, and like, you know, beans are said to have a lot of protein. However, it's only like 42% utilizable, you know, by us. Whereas like a steak is probably like 92% utilizable for, by us. And so if we're looking to get enough protein, the animal protein sources are going to be way better, way more bioavailable to us. Uh, And we talked about how the saturated fat is not the cause of heart disease already. So that takes care of that. Um, But it's important to get like, you know, what I recommend is about, you know, at least one gram of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. And that is just to maintain the muscle mass you have right now. If you want to increase that to muscle mass, you have to eat more. Yeah. And do other things like train or 
Well, yeah, like actually work out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or get into the sauna or something. Get the meat chop proteins. Make sure that, yeah. That, yeah, is, yeah. that you're staying in there. Man, that is like crazy, but so simple. And I do think as well that um, not all animal protein is created equal as well. Like um, mm-hmm. depending on like how the animals raised, where it comes from. Being in Australia, like we're quite blessed. Like literally everything's pretty much, if you look at it, it's like all grass fed. And then you look mm-hmm. at the steak and it's like, oh, we've been grain fed for a hundred days like, to make mm-hmm. it look good. It's like, just keep it grass fed. Come on, guys. But, um, <laughs> what do you think would be if, if someone was to like start eating like more protein? What do you, what do you think would be like the best animal sources? Uh, I mean, I think red meat is probably the best and the most, I think, evolutionary consistent with with humans, you know, is red meat. Um, and it's, to me, I like it because it has the right ratios of everything, especially if it's grass fed. So um, it's going to have, it's going to have a better ratio of, of fatty acids if it's grass fed. Um, but it has, it has a good ratio of, of um fats to protein, right. Of energy to nutrients. And that's important. So like, you know, chicken is, is fine too, but it's a lot less fat. So it, and it's way more nutrients. So, so like way more protein, um, which is, which is fine, but you just want to make sure you get the energy source too. So when I think of like an ideal food, I, I think of like a ribeye steak, um, because it satisfies all the things it gets the protein. There's tons of nutrients. People don't understand because everybody talks about like kale and other things, you know, be, being nutrient dense, but a steak is incredibly nutrient dense. Um, and it's got the energy source. Um, it's got the fat with it and it's in the right ratios when you eat it, when you eat the whole, you know, uh, as a whole food, you know? Yeah. I mean, I just love to extract this from you just real quickly. It's like, what did you like, if you had like an ideal day for mm. like stuff to do for someone, if they're like, all right, if I wanted to tick off everything in the day and just make sure like this day was perfect, like what would you recommend, um, someone to do and that's also including other things in terms of like mm. exercise or what not to use or what to actually use and do with yeah. like a, a day that you think would be really good yeah so like i'll probably list a lot of things here and i'll just kind of go through like what i try and do yeah in a day it could, and i'm not perfect by any means i'm not saying that what i do is is ideal um for for everyone but i'll just say that what i do and why but i also don't want people to you know, I'm going to list these things and it, for some people, it may sound like overwhelming. Like, how could I ever do all those things in a day with our, with what I already do, you know? And the, and the point is not for it to be overwhelming. Yeah. And but, you, you know, study this get, stuff as well. You're like on the extreme end. Like and you, and I didn't book's really successful and, and highly regarded. Like, yeah. And, really and really I didn't good. wake up one day and say, I'm going to do all this stuff, you know, it was gradual. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't, so I don't expect people to wake up tomorrow yeah. after they hear this and, and be like, I'm going to do all this stuff. Yeah. You know? But if um, any people are listening and they just kind of think like, Oh, that would be awesome. Like, and it relates to you and you can find it really easy to do. Give it a try. Yeah, definitely. Just add it to your routine. And then, you know, maybe a few months from now you add something else and pretty soon you're, you're on your way, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so I, um, the first thing I do when I open my eyes is, is do Wim Hof breathing. So- um, yeah. So it's just, you know, following that it takes about 15, 20 minutes to do it. Um, and that is, that is something that I have noticed to, to me is, is one of the few things I've noticed that affects my heart rate variability the most, um, which is huge, which is the measure in your, your stress response. Um, so I do that and then I roll over and I grab my little notebook and I write down what I'm grateful for um, in a notebook. Um, and I just, I write that every day and it usually, it usually has to do with what I have planned for the day and why I'm grateful that I've, you know, have those opportunities for, for that, for the day. Um, then, um, I get up and I don't, I take, I take my supplements in the morning. Um, I take some magnesium, I take some, um, some heart supporting supplements, um, like some amino acids, like arginine and, um, and stuff like that. Um, what else do I take? I take berberine. Um, me too. I've been on the berberine train recently and loving yeah. it. I, I like it. Well, I'm type one diabetic, so it's really helpful for blood sugar stuff. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, I, I did that and I take, um, gosh, what else do I take? Um, oh, I take liposome glutathione. Um, and then, and then I, uh, I don't eat in the mornings. I just take the supplements. Um, 
and uh, and then I take a, a cold shower, uh, which sounds may sound awful to people, but it's part of the Wim Hof thing. And again, it's when I started doing that combined with the breathing is when I noticed the most difference in my heart rate variability. Um, so that's the morning, um, and then and I drive to work. Um, and uh, you know, work. I'm 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 a chiropractor. I interact with people. Um, I, I treat mainly neuromusculoskeletal conditions. So um, it, it may just sound like, oh, I go to work and I do a shift. But the important thing there is that I, I'm fortunate that I get to talk to people all day long, you know, because that social aspect is incredibly important for, important for humans. And I'm not really the most social person. Uh, I wouldn't call myself extroverted uh, or a social butterfly or anything like that. But, you know, my job gets me out there talking to people, um, and, and caring for them. And I feel like that I'm really lucky that I get to do that. Cause that's, um, really beneficial to my health. Um, then, um, on full days, which are Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, we have a lunchtime and I'm usually reading in the sauna. Um, and, and while I eat my, my lunch, <laughs> um, so, or sometimes I'll sit instead of in the sauna, like in the summer, I'll sit like outside in the sun, like barefoot and stuff like that. Um, while I read, if I don't get too sweaty, cause I have to go back to work after that. Um, <laughs> then, uh, then yeah, I, I come home and I, um, have to work and I, and I eat my second meal of the day. Um, usually a little bit lighter cause I don't like to eat too much before I go to bed, um, or too, too big of a meal. Um, for me, that's because of type one diabetes and like, I'm having to gauge insulin levels and, 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 or blood sugar levels and how much insulin to give. And so, the more I eat in the evenings, um, the harder it is to, to gauge how much to give myself throughout the night and everything. So, um, so it's, it's generally a smaller meal in the evenings. And then I just kind of hang out and, and read or, or hang out with my wife or, or something in the evenings and we talk and, and those are the things I try and get done every single day. Um, you know, and then to, smash to, the steak. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah. Um, yeah, I try and go to bed about the same time, maintain that circadian rhythm. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's way more I think I could add to that, but that seems to be working well for me right now. Yeah, that's like really good, especially as like a baseline. And that's a lot of stuff, man. <laughs> that's a lot of things that you're like <laughs> mindful of and that you're really aware of and that you intentionally do throughout the day, which I think is fantastic. Also, yeah. I'd love to start talking about like your thoughts on on stress and emotions and how they also affect the heart and how you can sort of gain control over those things to influence your um, heart and heart health as best as possible. Yeah. This is a huge topic that I think is, is overlooked. Um, and it's, it's become um, one of my missions to, to talk more about this and get this information out there. Because when you talk about, like heart disease, it's always cholesterol, diet, that kind of stuff. And that's important, you know, like diet is important uh, when it comes to heart disease. But I think it's, I think it's kind of a, a, a second to, to the autonomic nervous system and our stress response. So our autonomic nervous system is the system in our body that's interpreting our environment through our senses and basically telling our body if we're in a safe or threatening environment. Um, if we're in a safe environment, then our body does things like relax, it can sleep, it can digest, it can do things like that, detoxify. Um, if it's, if it tells us we're in a stressful situation, then it has the appropriate response to get away from that stress or fight it off or whatever. Uh, and so then we're mobilizing, um, blood to our muscles. We're dilating our eyes. We're getting ready to, to, to fend off that stress. Um, and so the funny thing is, is that in nature, animals, you know, they're in a non-stress state, but if they encounter a stress state, they have the stress response. If they happen to get away from the stress, like if they survive the, you know, the cheetah getting out of the bushes and chasing the zebra or whatever, if they survive, then pretty immediately they go back to the non-stress state and humans are very different. We're the only species that, you know, can literally think our way into a stress response, even if nothing <laughs> around us stressful is happening to us. Right. So, you know, we could see something stressful happen to somebody across the world on the news and, and be scared it's going to happen to us. Or we can have something stressful happen actually to us. And instead of shutting down the stress response after it's gone, think about it for a month or two months or fear it's going to happen again. Right. Um, and we can perpetuate this and keep ourselves in this stress response. And that's not good because then we don't have this balance between 
the two states of our nervous system. And they're, they're, we, we talk about them like they're, you can be in one state or the other, but really the body is signaling both of them at the same time. And the bad thing that happens if we get stuck in a stress response is the non-stress signal actually gets lowered. Um, and it, we, it, we call it decreased vagal tone. Um, and then the, the stress response becomes more dominant. And then our body's always in the stressful state. So if you think about it, if your body constantly, but incorrectly is thinking that you're in a stressed state or you're in a stressful situation, you're not thinking about sleeping. You're not thinking about procreating. You're not thinking about digestion or detoxification. And so people who have this imbalance in the autonomic nervous system tend to have insomnia and sexual dysfunction and digestive issues and detoxification issues and that kind of stuff, because that, that stuff's never turned on. So this is really relevant to the heart though, because, you know, there's a reason you know, people, most people would accept and understand that there's this emotional connection to our heart. We say things like, I love you with all my heart, or mm -hmm. I gave it all my heart. There's this emotional connection to that organ. And, and it's, it's very well innervated um, as all our organs are, but this is very well innerv innervated specifically by our autonomic nervous system. Um, because it's almost, and actually the, the nerves that connect our heart and our brain, there's actually more signaling from the heart to the brain. Um, same from, from the gut to the brain, because these are the organs that are, are cluing into our body, you know, our emotional state. Um, and so based on our emotional state, then our brain reacts accordingly. Are we going to cry? Are we going to laugh? Whatever. Um, and so because the heart is so tied to our emotional state, um, our emotional state has a, a very big impact on how healthy our heart is. Um, and so, it, you know, it, the research is just is full of all the evidence that shows that, you know, heart rate variability, which is the best measure of balance in our autonomic nervous system that we have is extremely, or I guess low heart rate variability is, is extremely linked to um, poor outcomes uh, for heart health, uh, whether it's heart failure, um, you know, preventing or predicting heart attacks, um, high blood pressure, that kind of stuff. Like, um, and so it, it becomes really important to pay attention to that more than just, you know, because every time you hear about like, how do you prevent heart disease? It's always like, at least in the conventional, you know, um, government organizations and academic institutions are always like eat less saturated fat, um, <laughs> exercise, exercise, um, you know, whatever else and manage your stress. It's like always the end, you know, it's always like the tail end of things, but it's like, I think it should be first. And, and when you look at, the world we live in today and how incompatible it is with a normal stress response. Like all the things that we deal with today that we never really would have had to deal with before. Um, then, then it's, it, it, it's no wonder that we're in this, this, this huge, um, I guess this epidemic of, of, of heart disease, uh, that we're seeing. So, yeah. so, I mean, that's, that's in a nutshell, I guess, what, what, you know, the autonomic nervous system stress and how it affects the heart. No, oh, hundred percent. And what are some of the things that obviously, because in terms of de-stressing or it's even like getting mm -hmm. in touch with your emotions, right? Like what would you suggest people actually do mm -hmm. in regards to allow themselves to calm down? Obviously Wim yeah. Hof breathing is something that's going to help you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's one example. Yeah. What, what are some so, others? So just like, you know, we mentioned earlier, just like, I, I would never recommend someone, um, take a ton of supplements if they weren't going to change their diet. Mm. You know, if they were just going to eat a terrible diet, the supplements probably aren't going to do you much good, or at least not as, as much good as they could. If you change your diet, same kind of thing here is that I could tell you to do all these different things that have been shown to improve your heart rate variability and lower your, your stress. But if you don't find the things that are actually stressing you out and work to mitigate them or remove them, if you can, then you're just, you know, you know, putting out the fire without catching the arsonist, you know? Um, and so that's the first thing I'd say is try to identify the things in your life that have the most impact on you stress wise, which it can be difficult. And sometimes you're going to find out that those things you can't get rid of. Maybe it's that job that you're, you need, or maybe it's your kids. You can't get rid of them, you know, like, and so it, then it becomes changing your perspective of those yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and how you view them, but then also sometimes, and I've worked with clients on this, sometimes it's, 
it's, it's more you than it is the thing that's stressing you out every time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so like, so I had a client one time that was, you know, her kids really stressed her out and I said, okay, well next time. And I'm not like any like therapist or anything like that. I was just like, well, next time think about what you said to them first or how you presented to them or whatever. And she realized that her, her initial, um, you know, feedback or response to them was arming them. So then now they're armed and they're going to come back at her. And then she was like, why are you doing that? And it's just like, so then she started to work on changing how she approached them or whatever. And it totally changed the whole situation most of the time. Right. Um, so there's that. Um, and that was just a little tangent or whatever, but um, That's true. My sister's one thing a... that, oh, sorry. yeah, no, one thing that I came across um, not too long ago um, was a study that where they looked at um, um, the effects of stress on different people within a company. Right. Um, and they expected to find that the people with the most responsibility and the higher end, high demand, high stress jobs were going to have the most negative effects to their health. Right. Um, specifically, this study was looking at atherosclerosis. Right. And so, so they're looking at the CEOs, the people with all the responsibility, and they found that those people had um, the least effects on their health. They were, you know, they were, um, they were in, cause they were in control. They had the power, they had the responsibility. Um, they had a lot of stress. Yeah. And high demand jobs, but they were in control. And it was the people lower down in the company that, you know, didn't have quite as much job security or didn't have predictable work hours um, or, or predictable salary or things like that, those people were the ones that had the highest stress. So the moral of the story there is that if you can identify stresses in your life that make you feel like you don't have control or they give you a lack of predictability and it, it's hard to anticipate things like that, um, those are the stresses you want to work to mitigate the most because those have been shown in research to have the most detrimental effect on your health. Crazy. And I think one of the main things that like people can do to do that is actually have some sort of like spiritual practice or take yeah. some time for themselves to, you know, either meditate or get some stillness. Like because I coach entrepreneurs and like high performers, I created this like diagram that had this, it's sort of like an energy wheel I like to use. I use a lot of wheels in like my diagrams and in <laughs> terms of just like getting balance between your mind and your body. And it's sort of like, you know, your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous state. I think one of the most important things which is overlooked now, especially in like 2021, is just like stillness and self-control. And if you firstly take time to take some stillness within your day, it could be a small amount, like a real small amount. It allows you just to like clear your mind and think about all the things that you need to think about. Sort of like you spread them all over the table and then you sort of dissect and make them a whole lot smaller. And then you sort of be able to, because you have that stillness, just think about all the things that you need to have a little bit of control with. And just for the people that like I've been working with and the people that, that, that I coach, as soon as they add that in, it's, and they, and they can stick to that either consistently on a daily, weekly or monthly basis. And it's like depending obviously, because how much they have, they, they need a little bit more, but it just has like these, just these awesome results that you can see. And I've used it myself when I track things for like my heart rate variability that when I, when I spend half an hour to an hour a day, just with complete stillness, which is, sometimes so hard to do to like book it in and be like, no, I'm just going to take this. <laughs> Everything feels so much better. The stress goes way down. I make way better decisions and I end up getting, end up being like way more productive with everything that I'm doing, which I find is like fantastic. Yeah, no, it, it's totally true. If you take that time to, to clear your mind, to slow your mind, to calm your mind, you're going to be way more productive when you, when you do have to be, you know? Yeah, and I, I just have a theory. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. You, you may know some research, you may not. And mine is, I think that we sort of, after reading the book Deep Work by Cal Newport, I read, I read that and just um, attending a, just a couple of courses on um, health and heart rate variability was just, this had the own click in my own mind. I'd just love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> there may not be nothing mm -hmm. on it, just a theory that I've had. And yeah. essentially it's like we need to have a certain amount of stillness within our just lifestyle and whether that be daily, weekly, monthly, six monthly, whatever it is, is we sort of have a tank of it. And if we're not getting that stillness in throughout like our day, it will just back up. 
So for example, it may, and I, I believe everyone has different tolerances. And I, I believe, like, you know, let's say for one person, like, it could be something around like having half an hour of stillness a day. Well, if you don't get that from Monday to Friday, then Sunday, you need to spend half the day chilling. If you are all go for a month, then you may need the weekend to just do nothing or three days, like public holiday, come at us. <laughs> or <laughs> like if you don't do it throughout an entire year, it's when people take holidays, they'll take the full six to four weeks off and just do nothing for four to six weeks. Um, feel like don't do anything productive, but they come back and, oh, I feel so much better. Then they have to wait a whole nother year before they can take like their holidays again. And like, I just have the theory that if you don't do this within a certain period of time, your body sort of will shut you down, make you get sick or intentionally make you feel terrible so that you take time to have stillness to actually recover itself because it's like, oh, I'm better now. Just just to like get rid of stress. That's a theory yeah. that I've been playing with. What are your thoughts no, I, on that? <laughs> and I, I, I like it, you know, and it's a good kind of um, framework, I guess, for people to, to use to make sure they get that in, you know? Um, and I do think you're right. Like, you know, when we get that imbalance in the autonomic system, uh, lots of times we get like in this hyper stress state and all of a sudden we get fatigued or we get like this shutdown. And that's, we need to listen to that. That's your body saying, Hey, we gotta, we gotta shut this down for a while. Right. Um, and, and it's so like, it's so simple, you know, to just listen to your body a little bit, you know, just like, if you think you hear, like you, let's say you hear someone in a podcast or, or you read a book or something like that. And there's this new diet, you want to try it and you try the diet and you've been doing it for a few months and it just sucks. You can't do it. You're like, this is not, or, or even your health gets worse or something. People are like, but I read the book and it says that it's better for you. So I know it's been, they keep trying to do it. It's like, well, maybe we should listen to our body a little bit. And, and maybe this isn't the right diet for us, you know, um, or something like that. So it's just listen to your body. And then, you know, I, I think that, have you ever heard of the idea of uh, dopamine fasting? No, I haven't. I'm, I'm yeah. super intrigued, man. I'm super intrigued. Yeah, so like this. dopamine is the, it's like the feel good, you know, hormone that is secreted. Like, so anytime you do something like, you know, even like writing something down on a checklist and then checking it off gives you a little dopamine release. It makes you a little Putting surge. Putting a post like, up yeah. on social media. Yeah. You're like, yeah, great. You know, like I did something or, um, or even just looking Achieving at social a business media, goal. Yeah. even looking at social media and seeing the little likes and the comments and everything like that. Like yeah. um, it can be as simple as that, or it can be as, as, um, making, a sale. Uh, making a sale. Um, it could be anything like that, but the, the issue is, is that there's too much of it and that we get addicted to these dopamine hits, you know, so that we have to have them all the time. So when we sit and do nothing, we can't. And people, you know, there's like the studies that show that people, people reach for their phones like a million times a day or whatever it is, you know, because we need that dopamine. We're addicted to that dopamine hit. And so a really good thing that I heard, it's not my idea, but I heard from somebody else, um, uh, it's called dopamine fasting. And it's kind of what you were talking about where like, if you didn't do any stillness or, or, or whatever you want to call it during the week, you're going to have to take half of, of Saturday or half of Sunday and just sit and, you know, no dopamine stimulus whatsoever, which is really, really hard to do. That means like no talking to people. Um, it means like no phone, no movies, no, no reading. Cause that could, you know, stimulate dopamine. So that that's really hard to do, but it could be an amazing reset um, to get you off this addictive dopamine hits that, that, that we, you know, that society around us has addicted to, you know, like the notifications on the phone, the email, Oh yeah, I got to check it, you know? And it's just, it's, uh, it could be really, really useful, but if you did it in small amounts throughout the week, you wouldn't have to take, you know, half the weekend to, to detox from that dopamine hit or those dopamine hits. Dude, that is crazy. I love that. I'm going to look into that a little bit more dopamine fasting. I really like yeah. that. What are some things that you have like researched yourself that um, that you have used and implemented that you think is like some of the best best tools or researchers that you've actually developed, created, or researched and been like, ah, this is the best. I really want to share this. Um. Well, I mean, I guess a, a big thing for me um, was what my first book is about which my first book is called the health evolution. Um, and for me, it was just, you know, from, from a very young age, I had a lot of chronic illnesses and things, and I I've since gotten rid of most of those. Um, but it, and I did that through like, you know, trial and error, like lifestyle type, type stuff, but it wasn't until I really understood like evolution. And I always look at things from an evolutionary perspective that I started, you know, to get the answers as to why I was sick in the first place. 
And so one thing I really like to share, which is why I wrote the first book about it, was that, you know, these principles of evolution that I think um, were, that enlightened me and, and gave me understanding as to why I was sick as a child and why humanity is, is sick today. Um, and so, you know, looking at things from an evolutionary perspective, like the environment that we live in today is drastically different than the one that humans evolved in for hundreds of thousands of years. You know, if you want to take modern humans, you know, that have been around for 200, 300,000 years, that's a long time. But even before that, mechanisms in our body were evolving, you know, before modern humans even existed, you know, and those mechanisms are still consistent. So it's a very long time. And then, you know, since about maybe somewhere between 10 to 15,000 years ago, which sounds like a long time, but evolutionarily, it's not a very long time. Um, you know, our lives dramatically changed. Um, and that was with the advent of, um, or I guess the, uh, I guess the, the use of, of, you know, a crop culture of agriculture, which made us, allowed us to settle down in cities. And that totally changed the, the nomadic lifestyle that we were living. Now we stayed in one place in close quarters with animals and other people. And it's just so many things change in such a quick amount of time. There's no way that evolution could have taken place to adapt us to those changes fully. Um, there has been some adaptation, but when I think about why we're having such a bad response to the modern world we're living in, it's because there's, there's no way we could have adapted to the changes we've made. So the, there was some really interesting um, research done by a um, Russian scientist in Siberia, where he started selectively breeding these Arctic foxes. Um, and he, he would like look for the ones that had more docile traits uh, and he would only let them breed. And so he did that generation after generation after generation. And when he got to about 30 generations, he basically had dogs, these foxes that were like dogs. They would come up to him and he would pet them. They'd, he would feed them and they were basically his pets, you know? Um, so that suggests that, you know, we need, you know, at least 30 generations to have, you know, significant change, but that was very controlled, selected breeding, you know? Um, so, no, actually, I think it was, it was 30 generations just to start to see traits change, like the ears and the foxes were up like this because they were living in the wild and they needed to, to hear what was around them to survive. And, and the, the ears started drooping um, because they didn't need that anymore. And the, and the color of the coat started to change. But by the, that scientist has since died by the 50th generation of this experiment, because people like, you know, um, kept doing the experiments after this guy died. Um, that's, that's when they had dogs. So, um, so that's, that's 50 generations. So if you think about that, that is a long time, especially in humans, because foxes breed quicker, way quicker than humans do. Um, they have a gestation cycle that's that's shorter. So that's way too long for us to have adapted to the changes that we see. And, and the changes keep getting faster and faster and faster, right? Because, you know, you know, maybe a hundred years ago, most people were probably farming, you know, um, and, and a very different lifestyle. Whereas today, most people are sitting behind desks like I'm doing right now, right? Um, for most of the day, that, that's our, our work has changed and that's just one of the changes that's happened. So um, I like to illustrate that to people. I like people to understand that because to me, it gave me a lot of answers and understanding. So I hope it does the same for other people. Just like how important your environment is in terms of yeah. like your house set up, how you're living, what you're using for cooking, cleaning, how you actually do it, how much time you're spending outside and being aware of all of those things. Yeah. And it, cause you know, when I would tell people like, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that. You got to avoid toxins. You got to eat this way, whatever. They're just like, why do I have to do all this stuff? Not nobody, nobody else does all this. So like society, that's not normal in society. And you have to realize that, that the society is not what's normal when it comes to our physiology, like what we're doing in society today, lots of things are not normal. And I'm not saying that people should leave society and go live <laughs> yeah. out in the woods or something like that. That's not realistic either. You just change um, but I'm, a bit. Yeah. Just look into your environment, into your, your modern day environment and, and make it um, more like it would be in, in, so like, you know, light, for example, you know, when the sun goes down, you know, use um, uh, less light around the house so that your body starts to, to get prepared for sleep. Even using red light w would be yeah. like optimal, you know, I'm going yeah. to buy some more salt lamps today because I've just moved into yeah. my house and like literally yeah. I keep writing notes of stuff that I need and taking it off. But one of the most important things I was like, I need some more salt lamps near because at nighttime I keep turning the light on and I'm like, this. yeah, exactly. And and your body's getting triggers to, to stay awake oh, and then that messes with your sleep cycle. So it's just like 
all those little things you got to think about. And, and, you know, especially for people who, you know, have to wake up in the morning and perform at a high level at their job or whatever, like all these things may seem trivial. Like there's no way I could do all this within my, with my day, but it's just like, if you made these small changes and you made them part of your routine, imagine how much more, um, um, how much more um, of a high performer you would be, you know, when you get, when you need to be, you know? Yeah. And it's also really hard to convince people not to do stuff because you get really set in your ways. And when you have to change not to do something because you're so stuck to doing something, it's mm-hmm. really hard to do. And I find it's a lot easier to get people to do and try new things. But however, it's this education and awareness of stuff, which is, I believe when people really understand is, is when they actually start to make decision to be like, well, I'm probably going to move this or I'm probably going to throw this out. <laughs> yeah. It's understanding. It's really, really important. So like when I coach people, like I want them to understand why they're doing it. I don't just say, go do these things. We'll meet back in two weeks. You know, like I want, I talk to them and say, this is why you're doing this. Do you understand that? Yeah. Because if they understand it, they're going to, they're going to continue with it more, you know, rather than just try it for a few weeks and then forget why they're doing it and then stop. Yeah. All right. So for someone who is, sort of at that, at, that sta- at that stage of their life where they've had some success, they've maybe had some financial success, they, they know where they're going in their life and they're sort of, they've got some things sorted out. And they're like, all right, I need a bit of a lifestyle change because I just want to improve the quality of my life to either live a more fulfilling life or to perform at like a high level. As far as some of the must-dos and the, like the necessities of stuff that people should have, whether it be like as a task going through their house and and making sure that they have, you know, eye level lights and darker red lights or getting some sort of sleep tracking software or or having regular chiropractic or physio visits or something like that. What do you think just in like in your mind and your perspective are some of the absolute necessity things that um, you would encourage people to give a crack at? Yeah. Um, I, you know, this is really important. Um, it's really important to realize that, and I'm, I'm confronting this now at age 34, um, that, you know, cause then in my twenties, you know, and coming out of chiropractic school, I can adjust a million people a day. If you want to be, you know, I was just like, you know, and, and, and then recently I, that's right. Yeah. And then recently I you know, was adjusting the same way I've always adjusted. And I got this inflammation in my ribs because of the way I was adjusting. And I was like, man, I'm getting old, you know, like I'm not able to do that anymore. You're 34, so, man. You're still a baby. Jesus. <laughs> I know. Right. And I was like, man. And I started to realize that no matter how hard I try, like your body still does slow down a little bit, you know? Um, and, it, and so it's important, you know, you, you worked really hard, whatever, and got you to that point where you are and you've had the success, you know, in order to maintain that, you got to start watching out for yourself. You know, so this is really important thing so that you can, you can maintain that high level. So I've, I've changed the way I adjust, um, because I, I have to, you know, maintain, uh, adjusting people. Um, but I'd say that, you know, my, my three pronged approach to not just like heart health, but just like health in general is you want to, you want to protect three things. One, you want to protect your metabolic health. That's huge. Um, and so we talked about that, you know, that's you know, eating that whole food, you know, relatively low carbohydrate, um, uh, most of your energy from animal, animal fats and prioritize protein diet. Um, that's, that's critical. Um, because that's linked to so many different, there's not, I don't think there's one disease out that doesn't have some aspect of poor metabolic health in it. So that's huge. Um, the second one is, is make sure you're doing everything you can to decrease oxidative stress or, and, or inflammation. Um, and so that's, you know, managing your stress. That's, um, uh, avoiding toxins in your environment, um, eliminating toxins that may have been put into your environment, like, like uh, mercury fillings and things like that, you know, um, that kind of stuff avoiding. Um, so that I guess the big five that people are exposed to like toxins is like food, water, air, um, cosmetics and cleaning products. Like look at those five areas of your life and make sure you're getting the cleanest products. You're, you're avoiding the most toxins as you can. Um, uh, that that's huge for oxidative stress inflammation. And then the third one is like, we've talked about, um, that spiritual side of things, that emotional side of things, you've got to, you gotta, you gotta pay attention to that. It's the easiest one to ignore though. Um, but you've got to pay attention to that and you've got to, you got to keep that side healthy, whatever it may be for, for some people it's religion, 
or, or prayer or whatever. And that's what they use. And that's what keeps them grounded and keeps them, um, um, their head, you know, in the right place, you know, other people it's, it's nature and, 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 uh, meditation and, and things like that, or it's a combination of all those things, you know, like whatever you need to keep your body, you know, or keep your mind, um, uh, I guess, uh, functioning optimally, not getting too stressed out with you know, that stillness you talk about, um, do that. Those three things I think are, are my, uh, main things. I think there's all, there's all kinds of other things you can pay attention to, but those things are the most common, the commonly, uh, the most commonly when they get out of balance are the most common things that lead to dysfunction. That's going to hurt your performance and, and, uh, um, get you somewhere you don't want to be. So pay attention to those things. Oh, Stephen, thank you so much for sharing all of that. And thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing all of your wisdom for any of anyone who was listening like this podcast has been amazing there was so much in there i would strongly recommend like writing down some notes or something because there is a lot to actually go through in there and I, I can't wait to listen to it again because there was definitely parts in here i've just been like if anyone's watching me or the camera's on me and i'm just like touching my head and being like because <laughs> <laughs> i find it's absolutely fantastic so if people want to ask you a question or um they'd like to f- follow you or and get your books and stuff where can they find you uh, yeah, my, my website is resourceyourhealth.com. Uh, and, uh, my books are there. My blog is there. Um, uh, that, and I run my, my coaching through there. Um, my, my, my first book, health evolution is on Amazon. So you can find that the, the second book is we're republishing through a publisher. So it's not available just yet. I'm hoping by early next year. Um, and then I'm on, um, social media a bit reluctantly, but I'm on social media, um, at, uh, DR Stephen Hussey for Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And thanks for coming on to the show, man, and and taking time out of your day to share this good message and help people to become more aware. Yeah, thanks for having me. All good.